That's a good question. Thank you for being here with Dolce today. Pleasure. <laughs> we've had so much fun. Um, we've had fun with fashion. Um, and I just wanted to start off by asking you about your love for fashion. You often say that you're a fashion victim. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so can you just kind of speak on what fashion means to you and how it's evolved over time growing up? Well, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, my mother uh, was obsessed with fashion. She would go shopping in the souk and uh, get dresses and get her shoes dyed to match it. And of course, my grandmother was a seamstress. Uh, and uh, my family had a, a clothing store. And my uncle who moved to New York, Sammy, was obsessed. So, you know, when I'd go to New York, that's what we would do. We would shop together uh, and come up with uh, all sorts of things, including vintage and trash and vaudeville in the East Village. So. I've always loved it. I, I think it's just creative and it's fun and I, I find it uplifting. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be profoundly artistic, uh, like Alexander McQueen stuff. Um, and many of the museums are actually showing uh, some of the, the art from uh, designers. Mm -hmm. And so I've just always found it a beautiful thing. And then... Yeah, and how would you describe your style? I'd say probably a bit punky, although I'm in pink today. Uh, <laughs> a very unusual event. Uh, it's a little gothy, a little punky, probably uh, edgier than traditional. You recently came out with your, your new memoir, mm -hmm. Nothing But The Truth, We Have It Here. Um, I love the read, it was, it was great. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of speak on how it came together. You mentioned that it came together, or what was the process in putting the book together? Well, you know, I think I had a general idea of where I wanted to go with the book, but uh, the interesting thing for me was every time I started writing a chapter, which I thought was about one thing, it ended up being uh, about something completely different. And I found that every time I was trying to explain uh, a part of myself, I ended up describing people in my life. And that's when it became very apparent to me that the structure of it, at least the, the first part of it, was really structured around the people in my life that uh, were not only important to me, but would explain aspects of me. And what's the biggest lesson that you've learned over the years about the human experience through the cases that you've worked on? I think the, the, the thing that you cannot miss when you've uh, been in a courtroom is, uh, particularly criminal law, is a great deal of um, tragedy and a great deal of distress and a great deal of very raw emotion, but in the course of that, um, you see some incredible people uh, rise above it and be profoundly strong and, and gracious. Uh, and you know that is true of families of victims and and accused people. There's just uh, sometimes you are so impressed with the ability of people to overcome and to be just so gracious and so decent and there are many of those many of those moments after we spoke uh, last week I I went on the Globe and Mail and I saw that you were on the front cover and I was pretty shocked about it uh, it was it was um, pretty surreal for me because I would I had just spoken to you mm -hmm. um, and so in light of the reaction uh, by many of the people supporting the TDSB's decision do you feel that there's kind of a widespread misunderstanding of the role that criminal defense lawyers play in criminal justice and a well-functioning liberal um, democracy more broadly? Yeah, I, I think in fairness, most people don't have a lot of interaction with the justice system. You know, based it's based on what they've seen on TV or the traffic ticket and, and that's sort of the extent of it. I think when you actually see it in action, when you're involved in it in some way, you have a different perspective of it. And so I understand people's per perception of it because they just haven't uh, interacted with it in a, a deeply personal way. But that having been said, uh, I do think that it is important to educate yourself about our justice system and to, to be in a position to figure out what you think is great about it, what you think is not great about it, what we need to improve. I think people should know that the justice system is constantly adjusting and tweaking and moving uh, forward and thinking about things differently because it's it's manned by humans and so we're always tweaking it. Uh, it's not static. 
which makes it an interesting field to work in, but I think people should also understand that it is responsive to, to our changing views and our, our, um, our, our changing morals. And what would you say are the biggest um, shortcomings in the Canadian justice system? I think the, the greatest shortcoming is the way we've dealt with uh, Indigenous Canadians, racialized Canadians. Uh, that's true in the United States as well. The over-incarceration is um, shocking. We have not uh, done a, an adequate job or a good job of remediating what has been hundreds of years in the making. It is a very significant problem, the way that the justice system interacts with racialized members of the community. It is uh, something that needs to be corrected. Um, and what would you say is the biggest misconception um, that people have about criminal lawyers and the women criminal lawyers especially? I think the biggest misconception is that we are uh, represent when we represent somebody that we're advocating for the crime or or the conduct and that's not people conflate a lawyer with their with their client again i understand that it's just not understanding what our role is uh, i think one of the other misconceptions from tv is that we're just hired guns and we'll say whatever someone wants us to say we are professionals we go through a lot of training a lot of university to be doing what we're doing we're bound by uh, ethics as well and I don't think people really understand what we can do and what we can't do because we get so much of our information from, from TV. You say that it's not a Henan trait and that it's kind of uh, unique to yourself. Right. Um, <laughs> um, is there anything you're scared or intimidated by? Oh sure, my gosh, I, I mean I'm scared uh, of a number of things. Uh, you know, you're, you're scared of your own mortality, that's for sure. You worry about your family and um, your kids. Uh, I think though that it's not the thing that I think most about. I, I don't think about what's going to frighten me and I, I think generally if it's going to frighten me I would like to try it and get over get over the fear. I, I don't love that emotion of, of being uh, afraid to do something. I can live with trying something and failing at it but I don't like um, I don't like that that zone. That's not a comfortable zone for me to, to be afraid of something. And in terms of intimidated, no, not really. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and if you had to give advice to young lawyers uh, or aspiring lawyers, what would that advice be? I, I would tell them that they really have to have a, a very strong love of the profession and the subject matter. I think if you don't come into it with that, it's a lot of time to spend doing something you hate. And the hours can be very long, uh, the emotional commitment is extensive, and I, I think you really have to have uh, a passion for it. It has to feed some aspect of you and some aspect of you intellectually as well. Uh, it's a significant commitment, like any job is, and to go into this one, you have to come in, I think, with your eyes wide open and really loving it, because a lot of it is profoundly boring and and drudgery and it's not always excitement you know the two hours you see in court of a, a an exciting cross-examination is months and months and months in the making and that's just hard work so when you're doing that hard work you, you have to think to yourself well you know what there's nothing else I'd like to be doing and what are some of your hobbies outside of work well shopping's a big one for sure <laughs> um, uh, hobbies uh, I love uh, cooking I love reading um, and you know the rest of my time is is mostly at work really it's very much a part of my life I, I don't try to get away from it it's I love doing it do you have any regrets in life that's a good question do I have any regrets in life I regret I didn't find a discover straightening iron earlier <laughs> uh, that would have made my life a lot easier um, I, you know, the only things I regret are things that I did not do. I mean, uh, you know, chances that I didn't take. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably on a personal level, I regret uh, not being perhaps more patient and more empathetic. I think that is something that I always uh, have to check myself and struggle with. So if I look back, those would be the moments where I think there are times where that's where I should have been instead of uh, my go-to toughen up moves, you know, stiff upper lip, or, so. And, um, what does La Dolce Vita, the sweet life, mean to you? 
sweet life to me means uh, being with family and friends and having you know great conversations and learning things and that you didn't know and thinking about things that are just um, presented to you. I think those moments of, of human um, connection are the most important for me and that's La Dolce Vita. Well, thank you, Marie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. My name is Marie Hannon and I just finished an interview and photo shoot with Dolce. Sure, it took about six hours to make me look good, but I hope you'll tune in uh, and uh, take a look. It was a great conversation and a fun shoot.